Hi, um, welcome to the, the first in a series of videos on um, unjustly neglected Irish genealogical sources, uh, unjustly in my, my humble opinion, um, and neglected generally because they're slightly out of the way. Um, you'll get the idea when I start talking, okay? The, the first one is about uh, a, a sort of a cross-fertilization between Will's records and the pedigree records in the old Ulster Office of Arms. Um, the Ulster Office of Arms, now the Office of the Chief Herald or the Genealogical Office, was the main um, guardian of um, coats of arms. Coats of arms, contrary to what the souvenir sellers will tell you, coats of arms belong to individuals and they're very much a sign of breeding, of aristocracy. So um, the Office of Arms was the one that granted them, that um, confirmed them, that okayed, okayed people to use them. So it dealt with uh, a very particular uh, level of society, the, the upper crust. Um, I'm trying to avoid the word snob here, but um, not, not unsuccessfully. Anyway, the upper crust. And in the course of doing that, because, because they're inherited coats of arms, you need pedigrees. You need to know who people's ancestors were, who they inherited the arms from. Um, so in the course of its work, the office accumulated all sorts of um, genealogical finding aids. Um, it existed, the office, the, the Ulster office, existed as Ulster office up to 1948, which was kind of peculiar. It was well after the, the, um, the end of the, the union between Ireland and um, and the UK, well, the Free State and the UK. Um, and given that the Office of Arms was, in, in theory, um, answerable to the monarch, to the, 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 the monarch of Great Britain, um, it was in a very anomalous position. So, But it continued until 1948, and its successor is now the Office of the Chief Herald, and very much not only dealing with the upper crust, um, that's all changed. Okay, and let me reverse a little bit. Um, in the course of its, its work, it accumulated lots and lots of records. One of the series of records created by its most um, distinguished holder of the office of, of Ulster, King of Arms, was abstracts of family information in prerogative wills. Okay, what is a prerogative will? Okay, you need to understand how wills worked in Ireland um, before 1858, when the state took over the administration. Before then, the Church of Ireland, the established church, the state church, um, basically an arm of government administration, um, administered wills. And it did so on a diocesan basis. So if you all your property was in um, the Diocese of Cloyne, the Bishop of Cloyne was the one who granted probate to your, your heirs to distribute the property. Um, what happened if you had some property in the Diocese of Cloyne and some property in the Diocese of Arda? Okay. Would the bishops of Arda and Ar Cloyne have to toss a coin to see who got who got to deal with the, the, the wills? No. Um, they went to a separate office, which was based in Armagh, which was the, the, the principal, the overarching um, administration for the whole, uh, whole island. And the rather than a diocesan court handling it, it became the prerogative court, and that's why they're known as prerogative wills. Why are prerogative wills important? Because they tend to capture the upper crust, okay? The people with property in more than one diocese tended to be people with a fair amount of wealth, and these were the clientele of the Ulster office. So Beetham went down to the, the, uh, the prerogative court, uh, based in Henrietta Street then in Dublin, and went through all the pre-1800 wills and took all of the family information out of it, transcribed them into notebooks, worked the notebooks up into sketch pedigrees, and used them as a sort of working database of potential clientele. So when people came to him and um, said their, their ancestors were so-and-so, he could go and check the wills and see if what they were saying was correct or if there were branches of the family that they'd missed out and so on and so forth. So it was a, a, working, um, a working record. Um, I hope you're following me so far. Then, of course, in 1922, we blew up all the original prerogative wills. 
So they're all gone. But all of the family information in the pre-1800 prerogative wills is there in the Beetham um, abstracts, notebooks, and sketch pedigrees. Okay. Um, you can see, I think you, you might be able to, to see why some of these are unjustly neglected. It's quite quite complex um, um, connection uh, connections, but let, let me demonstrate how it works. Um, first, and the index to these prerogative wills. In uh, the 1890s, a successor of this man, Sir William Beetham. Uh, let me show you, Sir William. Okay, here he is here, um, the bell Sir William, in uh, a bust that is now in the office of uh, the Chief Herald in, here in Dublin. Um, but a successor of Beetham called uh, Sir Arthur Vickers created an index to the prerogative wills of Ireland up to 1810. Um, and this will tells you, this, this index tells you exactly what wills are abstracted by Beetham. And it's published and it's available on Ancestry, on Find My Past, I think, um, on, uh, on archive.org. Let me show you what it looks like. Index to the Prerogative Wills of Ireland. This is a copy that I downloaded from archive.org. And you can see it's purely alphabetical. You get the date of the will in the outermost column. You get the, the surname and a brief uh, name and occupation. Um, and you can see the dates, all of these wills, 1751, 1772, all of the family information in these wills is in the Beetham um, abstracts, transcripts, and wills, um, and will pedigrees. One of the things that there are a couple of peculiarities uh, about this, a couple of elephant traps here. First of all, Sir Arthur, the bell Sir Arthur, um, indexed all the wills up to 1810. So there you are, Nicholas Hoyne, 1804. Dublin City Baker. And this is one of the points about prerogative wills. They contain property in more than one diocese, but it didn't, it, it was property worth more than five pounds. Um, that could mean a small farm with five pounds on one side of the, the, the diocesan border and the other five pounds on the other side. So it wasn't a, a, an absolute fail safe upper crust filter. So there are lots of bakers and merchants. There's a carpenter, 1788. Archelaus, Stacumney, County of Kildare, a carpenter. There is Nicholas Hoyne, Dublin City of Baker, but that's 1804. So beat the money comes up to 1800. And, you know, Grenham's sixth law of Irish genealogy states that the prerogative will you want the family information from will have taken, will be indexed, but it'll be after 1800. So you see 1808, he won't be there. Um, 1766, he will. 1748, he will. Okay. Um, let me give you, show you how this works then. Um, I'm going to take uh, the Howells here, okay? Edward Clonmel, County Tipperary, Sadler. Okay, so Sadler again, well down the social scale. You're not talking about um, the creme de la creme here. You're talking about, uh, you know, artisan class, people who were illiterate, people who had some property, so they're not the, the, the most destitute, but they're certainly not uh, all... Um, going around with monocles and um, ivory topped silver canes. Okay, let me show you how to get at them. Again, back to uh, the website. Um, browse, records, genealogical office. And this um, section will give you the history of the, the genealogical office. Um, and this which is, this is the only place you're going to get this now. It was in the first edition of Tracing Irish Ancestors and we took it out for reasons of space. This is a complete list of all the genealogical office manuscripts. And the particular sub-series that we're interested in is one of the things about this, you can see I've tried to um, uh, indicate where things are online or if they're indexed, um, but the wills. Where are we? The Wills, the Beetham Wills. Wills, new series, volumes 1 to 26. Now, what's, okay, Vickers, 
there you go that will take you to archive.org and you can um, download your own copy of this um what's online are volumes 14 16 18 22 24 25 26 27 29 30 31 and 32. um so tough luck if you're looking for an ancestor with a, a surname between a and h um the reason for this is just that these were the volumes that were that needed conservation um, by the National Library Manuscripts Department, which now um, is responsible for these. And um, in the course of, of um, conserving them, the National Library also digitized them. So these are all now online. Um, so we were looking at Howell, and if you're wondering why I picked somebody starting with H, this is why, because volume H is here. So if you click on the online, you are taken to this. This is the National Library catalog. Okay, we'll agree to their cookies. Um, okay, that's all right there. Uh, and this is genealogical wills new series. We searched from it, digitized, and we're looking for volume 14, H to J. Volume 14, H to J. So volume 31, volume 32, volume 14. Here we are. Okay, you click on the image and you have a wonderful uh, high quality pin sharp digitized version of this volume. Okay, how do you know where in the volume? There are, you can see there are 226 leaves in it. So these are pretty substantial volumes. Um, the volumes themselves are indexed. If you go to the very end and go back, now this index here is not an actual index to the entries. It's an index to the what, what Beetham was called the alliances. In other words, the marriages. So these are the women who married into this. So you see there's Sarah Gillespie and Ellen Gilmore and so on. Um, if you come back a bit further, you'll get to, this is the index to the families. So the family we were looking at, you might remember, was Howell. So we're looking at the Howells. All those Howells should be on the same page. And Howell, 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 there we go, Howell, page 58. So page 58, let's go back to, you know, you, you, let's say 60 and see what where that gets us. That gets us to page 112. So we go back. Okay, another 20, that's 72, so we want 58, 58, 58, eventually we'll get there, and there we are, 58, Howell, Thomas Howell, Richard Howell, Thomas Howell, Edward Howell, Edward Howell of Clonmel in County Tipperary, Sadler, will dated the 13th of May, 1789, P, that's probated, the 12th of April, 1792. So he died sometime between 1789, between May 1789 and April 1792. He had children, John, John Howell, who married a Hannah Airy, I think that is, um, an Edward, a Richard, a Henry, and an Anne. Okay. Um, you also, these are the other Howells here. So you have uh, Richard Howell of, of Rath and County Louth, farmer, will dated 1786. Um, Okay, you have various additions in. Um, there will always, at the very least, be information about the will, when the will was made and when it was probated. One of the things that Beetham did with this, he hasn't done it for the Howells here, but one of the things he did, and the researchers in the office did, they used these as um, building blocks. So if they came across other families that were other information that was related, they would put it in, 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 in pencil. If they had two or three wills from the, the same family, they would knit them all together. Okay, so you can get very elaborate extended pedigrees in, in these. Um, as well as the, um, let's just come out of the full screen there, as well as the, um, the, these sketch pedigrees, which I think are wonderful, and where the, the main, I think the, the heart of working tool of the Ulster office um, in supplying pedigrees and in proving um, descent and so on. Um, 
th there are other manuscripts that created in the course of, of making these things. Um, th first of all, there's a, there's a second copy of them, apart from the, the version in the, the genealogical office. Um, there's another copy in the public record office of Northern Ireland made by Sir Bernard Burke. I don't think it includes all the, the annotations, all the elaborations of the subtrees, but it's there in Prony um, and it's available. Um, they, they're also in the course of making these, the physical manuscripts that Beetham used to make them. He went down to the, the, uh, to the prerogative court with various notebooks. And he, he wrote in, in rough, alter, you know, he had an A notebook, a B notebook, a C notebook, and wrote in the information into them and then brought the notebooks back to the, the genealogical office and elaborated them up into these, these sketch pedigrees. So the notebooks are in the National Archives of Ireland um, and they are on, they've been microfilmed. Um, they're on familysearch.org. They're, they're freely available there. The genealogical office, um, the entire collection of genealogical office records, um, all the way from one to whatever it is, 800, um, has also been microfilmed very poorly, I have to say, by the, 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 the Latter-day Saints. They're, the microfilms are only available via um, family, family history libraries attached to, to Mormon temples, so they're not quite as widely available as the notebooks. Um, but as you say, if you have a, a family with the surname in the right alphabetical range um, who had a will before 1800, you'll find all the information here. Um, I hope I've given you a flavor of how the, how the system works, how the various parts of it fit together, the index, the wills, the transcripts, and so on. Um, particularly because of what happened in 1922, a large part of the, the, the records that were in the public record office then and were destroyed were to do with these class of people, with the propertied um, Anglo-Irish members of the Church of Ireland and to have a, 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 a huge collection of information on them here is um, unjustly um, neglected. So um, I, I beat the drum about them whenever I get the chance. And I hope I haven't deafened you with the beating of the drum in this video. Um, anyway, good hunting. I hope I thank you for watching if you've got this far.